So we're now in the IntelliJ project for the EX24 example from my GitHub Live Lessons repository in the Java 8 folder. And we're going to talk about the EX24 example. And what this example does is it demonstrates the difference between a reentrant lock, which of course in this case is the Java reentrant lock, and a non reentrant lock, which is actually something I implemented here using Java var handle semantics, which is a non reentrant spin lock using var handles just for fun. And if we have time, we might walk through that example because it's pretty cool too. And this will demonstrate why reentrant locks are important if you have object oriented frameworks that have callbacks where the lock has to be held to protect internal framework state. And you'll see that uh, the reentrant lock works fine, whereas the non reentrant lock incurs self deadlock, which is the the bane of the existence of non reentrant locks. So here's the actual program. So you can see here, we're going to just run it first so you can see what's happening. So we start out by having a, the reentrant lock, and you can see it works fine. It counts down and then cancels itself. But then you're going to see that the, the uh, non reentrant version, which is the one that's running right now, is going to hang. And it only finishes because we basically had a timer <laughs> that caused it to be shut down after a few seconds, after 10 seconds or something. And so, as it says here, that the non reentrant test finished unsuccessfully due to self deadlock. So, that's just running the program showing how it works. So, now let's go ahead and take a closer look and see how these things actually fare in practice. And it's, it's a really cool example. First, we're going to have something called a countdown latch. We haven't really talked a lot about countdown latches yet. Countdown latches are something that we'll cover in more detail when we get to barrier synchronizers further down the road. But for now, we, we talked about them briefly in the introduction for Java synchronizers. And a countdown latch is basically a class that can be used to used in this case as a as an exit barrier. It's going to wait until either something happens or until a timeout occurs, and then it'll shut the program down. So you'll see how it gets used. Now we have two methods in the main method. There are two calls to run test. We'll look at run test in a second. And you can see the first one is going to use a reentrant lock, and the second will use the non reentrant spin lock. Reentrant lock, of course, is a Java class. Non reentrant spin lock is my little cool class that implements a non reentrant spin lock using Java var handles. And we'll talk about that because it's probably something that's worth knowing about. You can see that we're going to do this for 10 seconds, and every second, because it's in milliseconds, every second it's going to count down. And you kind of saw that if you look at the the program output when we ran it, it was counting down the seconds, and every second it would, would do something. Okay, so I'll tell you what, let's go look first at non reentrant spin lock, just for kicks. So this is my little implementation, and it also is fun because it shows off how to use Java var handles, which is this feature that came with Java 9, that gives you, the programmer, the application programmer, access to low-level mechanisms that used to only be available to people developing the Java class library itself. So this used to only be there for the, the power programmers and us mere mortals couldn't get to it, but now we can get to it too. So it's pretty neat. So a non reentrant spin lock implements the lock interface. That means it's got methods like lock and unlock and try lock and so on. And here's the implementation part. This is really interesting. It's got a static var handle. And a var handle, as we'll see, is just a way to get access to low-level mechanisms like compare and swap operators. Static means that there's only one of these, no matter how many instances of non reentrant spin lock we happen to create. So that's a static. This is what's called a class variable. That static class variable is going to be initialized by a so-called static initializer block. You may or may not be familiar with a static initializer block in Java. It's, it's it's been there from the beginning, but it's not the most common thing to do. And the static initializer block, its purpose is to provide initialization of static fields. So unlike a constructor, which, which gets called once whenever a new instance is created, the static initializer block is called once when the class is instantiated. So when the class is brought in or elaborated or brought into being, this block will be called. And you can see what it does. It uses Java reflection to go ahead and do the following. This is like some really funky stuff. I won't go into this in detail. I will not expect you to remember all this stuff, but it's interesting. So it goes and it gets a methods handle, method handles.lookup object. This is part of the Java reflection API. And then it says, 
L, which is the method handles lookup object, find var handle. And it gives the class file, which is basically the byte code for non rantrant spin lock. It goes and looks in that class, uses reflection, finds the field called value. So the, the string value here corresponds to the value field. This is using Java reflection to introspect and discover that field in the non rantrant spin lock class. And then it says, treat that field as an int. And you can see, indeed, it's an int. So now we've got this thing called value, which is a var handle. And if something really strange happens and an error is thrown, but that's not going to happen. So it should find that unless you like put the wrong class in here or something like that. So we've now got ourselves a var handle to this particular field. Remember, this is an instance field. Every instance of non rentrant spin lock will have its own copy of the value field. And now we've got a var handle to that field. And a var handle is basically a way of being able to access that field via reflection and to do it in a very efficient way. Notice that value is volatile, which means that it will be read to and written from atomically, as we talked about several weeks ago. Reads and writes to volatile variables do not linger in the cache. They go directly to memory, which is what we want here. So here's the try lock implementation. Try lock says, hey, value, which is a var handle, please perform a compare and set operation on this object, which is the instance of non reentrant spin lock for which try lock has been called. Please try to, please check to see if its current value is zero. And if it is zero, atomically set the value to one. So that's what compare and set does. That's very, that's pretty much identical to what you did in your implementation for spin lock for the try lock, except we're using a var handle here instead of an atomic Boolean or an atomic reference. Here's lock. Well, this should also look somewhat familiar. This, this lock method is not quite as clever as, as the spin lock that you implemented where we passed in the, the is canceled uh, supplier and so on. This is just conforming to what's provided by the lock interface, which doesn't have all those cool features. And what it does is it's basically saying, if the value is zero and try lock returns false because it was not able to acquire the, the value atomically, uh, just keep looping. And if you want to learn more about why, this is to the question we talked about earlier, if you want to learn more about why you should do this check for value equals zero, you can read these links for more details on why that is a good thing to do. This, this code here is non-interruptible. As you can see, it's just going to spin <laughs> forever until it either acquires the lock. I mean, it'll, just, it'll spin forever until it acquires the lock. So it's not interruptible. Here's an interruptible version of this. And so what this does is it has a forever loop. You could also use a while true, true loop if we wanted to. And we check to see if we're able to acquire the lock. If we can, we're done. Otherwise, we check to see if we've been interrupted. And if we have been, we throw the interrupted exception. So this is more along the lines of what you guys had for your lock method in the spin lock class where you passed in the is canceled supplier. And then here is the unlock method. The unlock method uses get and set. And this again should look very familiar to you folks who did the, the non-recursive spin lock implementation, the, the undergrad version. We simply use the var handle, we use the get and set method, and we say, please set this object's value field to zero. And if it turns out that it wasn't already locked by us, then something's gone wrong. And so we throw the illegal monitor state exception. So that again is very similar to the code that you wrote. We're just using var handles here instead of atomic, uh, atomic Boolean or atomic references. We don't bother trying to implement try lock. We don't bother implementing new condition. So that's a good example of how to use var handle to implement a non reentrant spin lock. And remember that non reentrant, that's the key thing. Okay, so with that in mind, Let's pop back over here and let's go take a look at run test. So run test takes a lock, which is either a reentrant lock or a non reentrant spin lock. And then it will set up the, the countdown timer and run the test. And so you'll see how this works. We'll take a look at that in a second. This code will start the timer running in the background in a background thread. And then the main thread will wait on the countdown latch for up to 10 seconds. And if it's signaled, or it's, if it's uh, counted down within that time, everything worked fine, the test finished successfully. If it didn't, then it means the test finished unsuccessfully due to self-deadlock. So this is just a way to time things out. 
So let's take a look at test, count, count, yeah, test countdown timer. Takes a lock, the milliseconds in the future that you want to continue doing the countdown until, and then the, the interval at which point you have the on tick method called back. This thing starts out by making a new countdown latch initialized to zero, or sorry, initialized to one. And then we go ahead and make ourselves a new countdown timer. And I'm gonna show you the countdown timer class in a second, it's really quite interesting. But for now, we make an instance of this. And just for kicks, we're gonna make an anonymous inner class implementation. So you can see what we do here is we say, new countdown timer, passing in the lock, milliseconds in the future in the countdown interval. And then we override the on tick method and we override the on finish method. We cannot implement this using a Lambda expression because it doesn't have a single abstract method. It's not a functional interface. Countdown timer is not a functional interface because it has more than one abstract method. It's got on finish and it's got on tick. So before we look at the details of how countdown timer works, let's first kind of talk through what these callback methods do. Let's, let's start with on finish. That's an easy one. When we're all done, when the countdown timer has reached the end, it automatically calls back the on finish hook method and it prints done. <laughs> so if you go back over here to the run thing, um, well, it never does call done because we don't count it down all the way, but if we had counted it down all the way, they would said, have said done. Let's take a look at on tick. That's a bit more interesting. So what on tick does is it's called back automatically from the framework with the number of milliseconds until finished. And what we're doing here is we print out the seconds that remain by taking the milliseconds until finish and dividing by a thousand because it's in milliseconds, that's the seconds. And then we do a little bit of math and we check to see whether we've exceeded some threshold that we define for kicks. And if we have exceeded that threshold, then this callback is going to invoke the cancel method to cancel the countdown timer. So in this particular case after, I think it's six seconds or something like that, or whatever, it's gonna cancel the timer. This call is very important because on tick is called back from the framework, which as we'll see in a moment, holds the lock, the rentrant lock. This cancel calls the framework cancel method and then it reacquires a lock, which is why it needs to be reentrant. Otherwise, we have self deadlock. And assuming all goes well, we then decrement the, the latch, which means that the main thread that's waiting up here is going to be able to return from a wait successfully. So we'll print that version, print, print that message. So once we set up this countdown timer, which we're going to look at in a second, we then start the countdown timer. And that thing is off to the races doing its countdown logic. So let's go look at the countdown timer. Now that we've talked about all this other stuff, we can finally take a look at that. Now, this code has been shamelessly purloined from the Android open source project, which is okay, because that's why it's there, to be purloined. And basically what it does is it schedules a countdown into some time in the future, and it notifies things um, using the on tick hook method along the way. And you can see how we, you saw how we did it. You, you basically say, I want to set up the uh, countdown timer to go off in 30 seconds. And every second, I want the on tick method called back. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this class. This class is an abstract class. Why is it an abstract class? Because it's got some methods in it somewhere. Here they are on tick and on finish, which are abstract methods. As you all know, hopefully by now in Java, an abstract method simply means that it's going to be something that must be provided by the, the class, the subclass that extends it. So let's take a look at what it's got. It's got a couple fields, actually got a bunch of fields. It's got the uh, milliseconds in the future, which is when the alarm should stop, when we've counted down all the way. We have the countdown interval, which is how, what the periodicity is of getting the on tick callback so that you can do something every, every second, for example, or every 10 seconds. We define ourselves a scheduled executor service. This is a little bit of a forward reference to something we're gonna cover later not too long, but fa uh, fairly soon. Scheduled executor service is an executor service that can have callbacks dispatched or tasks dispatched upon the passage of time. And what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna make a scheduled thread pool and then we're gonna tell it to get called back every so often. And you can see that when we make this scheduled thread pool, we give it a thread size of one. So it's a pool of one, not a big pool, but if we need to do it that way to work with the semantics. And then we give it a thread. This is actually the default thread uh, 
this is the thread factory, sorry, the thread factory we want. We want to make a new thread. We want this to be a daemon thread. And the reason we want to make it a daemon thread is when the main program goes away, we want this thread in the scheduled thread pool to also go away. So making it a daemon thread means it will not outlast or outlive any user thread. We keep a field that keeps track of when to stop the timer. We keep a Boolean that indicates if we've been canceled or not. And then here's the key thing. We have a lock, and that lock is either going to be a reentrant lock or a non-reentrant lock. However, if you give it a reentrant lock, you're fine. But if you give it a non-reentrant lock, then it'll self-deadlock for reasons that will become clear in a moment. Here's the constructor of countdown timer. As you can see, it goes ahead and sets all those fields. It basically gets an instance of scheduled executor, scheduled thread pool executor, and it sets a bunch of policies to a um, more civilized set of values. I won't ex expound upon that at the moment, but we'll talk about that when we get to scheduled executor service. For some reason, the default values are all backwards for reasons that have no meaning to me or I don't understand why they did that, but we set them so they're correct. Don't worry about that right now. Here's the cancel method. So cancel can either be called by some external client or via a callback when on tick is invoked. And what cancel does is it acquires the lock, which will need to be a reentrant lock, and then it goes ahead and updates the shared mutable state. So I should say update shared mutable state. So m canceled is a field that's being shared between multiple threads, so it needs to be protected by the lock. And then we also tell the scheduled executor service to shut itself down immediately because we've canceled it. And then because we're following the protocol that all good Java concurrent programs should apply, we unlock the lock on the way out in the finally block. Here's the start method. The start method also acquires the lock and just does a bunch of things to kick us off. And it schedules the timer. We'll take a look and see how that works in a second and unlocks the lock. Here's the scheduled timer method. This is a really interesting method. First thing it does is it makes a new runnable. So it's called timer handler. It's a runnable. And we use, once again, we use the anonymous inner class syntax here. The run method acquires the lock, because of course we need to be checking shared mutable state like M canceled. And what it does is it checks to see if we're done, in which case the on finish hook method is called back. And then it also says if we're not done and we've reached the point where we need to, to call back on the, the on tick hook method, dispatch the on tick hook method. And the key thing to note here is that the lock is held. So we've acquired the lock, the lock is held, on tick is called. And as we saw before, if on tick happens to call this is canceled, then that darn well better be a reentrant lock. Otherwise, we will end up self deadlocking here in the cancel method when the lock is called the second time. And there's a bunch of other math here I'm not going to go through in detail that basically figures out how much time we have left and so on. And what we do at the very end of this thing is we reschedule ourselves to run again in the future. So we re reschedule ourselves, which is this runnable, in the future. So that's basically a way we continue getting called back periodically. And here's the first scheduled. So we, we, we created this particular runnable as a local variable. And then down here, what you're going to see we're going to do is we're going to take that runnable and we're going to schedule it to run immediately so it'll kick it off for the first time. So that, that's what primes the pump. That's what starts all the wheels in motion. And then when the runnable's run method gets called back, it will then schedule itself again if it needs to, if it hasn't finished. So that's basically how the countdown timer works. It was sort of in a long-winded way of explaining why we have a need for a reentrant lock by showing an object-oriented framework. So countdown timer is an object-oriented framework, and the object-oriented framework has callbacks, and those callbacks need to have locks held for the duration of the callback to avoid corrupting internal state. But the callbacks themselves can call back into the framework, which reacquires the lock. So if it's not reentrant, then it'll self-deadlock. And that's exactly what the results showed when we ran the results, that the non-reentrant spin lock deadlocked on itself and had to be shut down through other means.